Good morning, church. How are y'all? Praise band did a wonderful job today. Always thankful for them. And we are continuing on in a series called 40 Days of Joy. And I uh, talked with y'all last week a little bit about the fact that many people uh, are hesitant to be joyful, reluctant to, or even to expect it because uh, maybe they've had an experience where things were disappointing or maybe they don't really uh, look forward to a joyful moment because they're afraid that they'll ruin it or they'll miss out on it. And yet joy is one of the best medicines for our hearts, uh, one of the best things that we as a Christian people can make use of, and it's a, a beautiful gift from God. And so we're spending some time looking at that today and... Um, we're going to use uh, a letter today called First Thessalonians that uh, is a great testimony to Christian joy. I mean, when you think about joy, uh, you are probably reluctant to take advice from somebody whose life has always gone exceedingly well, right? That uh, they've never had a bad day, never had a hard time, everything's been handed to them, everything's been wonderful for them. And so you're kind of like, well, you might tell me about joy, but I don't really think I can get much out of it because your circumstances have been so wonderful. Well, the letter to First Thessalonians is the exact opposite. Paul's life has been extremely difficult since he became a Christian, and the people that he has shared the gospel with and whose faith they have uh, received from him, uh, their lives have also been extremely difficult. And you can read the scriptures, and Paul tells you himself, He's been shipwrecked, he's been beaten, he's been run out of towns, he's been whipped and lashed and thrown in prison, starved to death almost in prison, and uh, his life has not been just rainbows and unicorns by any means, right? And then uh, alongside that, the church that he helped start in the region of Thessalonica, Macedonia, modern-day Greece, uh, they really received the, the good news of Jesus well. Uh, and they're a loving community, a, a friendly community, a, a one that cares for others and helps those that are in need. And yet, because of their faith, uh, they are not welcomed in their culture the way they once used to be. Some of the people they used to do business with have cut ties with them. Some of their friends won't talk to them. Some of their family uh, won't be near them. And on top of that, uh, they're just treated horribly. And so these two groups that are riding one another... Uh, are a fantastic example of well, how, how can you be joyful even in difficult circumstances? And they give you a, a wonderful idea and a good advice on how you can cultivate joy in your life, how you can build it within your life, and how you can share it with others. So lots to offer in this letter and certainly some experts when it comes to real Christian joy. So that's what we'll be looking at. And the letter is um, divided up uh, in, a, in a great way. Paul starts it off with a prayer. In the middle of the letter, he prays for him, and then at the end, he prays. And at the beginning of the letter, some of the most wonderful, encouraging words Paul ever speaks. The only church he's as kind to as this one is probably the one in Philippi, uh, Philippians. But he writes to him, and he's like, I just thank God for y'all. You know, I, I'm so appreciative of you. I, I'm so thankful for what y'all are doing in the world and how faithful you have been. You know, you, you became imitators of our faith and you've grown into it. You've done all sorts of wonderful things. He talks about the good times he's had with them and then he addresses some of the problems that they're facing. You know, he, he prays for them about midway through the letter and then he says, and, and here's where your heart's been broken. You've lost friends. You've lost people that you love to death or to persecution and uh, he says but but be assured you know there'll come a day when Jesus will return and we'll all be together again right and you can read about that in first Thessalonians chapter 4 and then he finishes out the letter uh, first lessons Choni first Thessalonians chapter 5 I speak for a living uh, that he he does that. He gives them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He shares with them some encouraging words, some good advice on how to be joyful together. And that's essential. If you ever had bad roommates, 
if you have annoying family members that you have to live close with, if you have coworkers that you struggle to be around for a long period of time, then you know how essential it is to have some ground rules, some good ways of living together. And Paul shares that with them, and he gives them some encouraging words, countless words that he has shared with other churches for, for certain, and uh, tells them that here's some things you need to keep in mind. So we're going to look at that. Uh, this is First Chapel... First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. Brothers and sisters, we ask you to respect those who are working with you, leading you, and instructing you. Think of them highly with love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are disorderly and comfort the discouraged. So brothers and sisters, we ask you to respect, this is 12 again, those who are working with you, leading you, and instructing you. Think of them highly with love because of their work. Live in peace with, uh, with, uh, with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are disorderly. And so he's saying, y'all are facing hard times. You're going through some struggles and some pain and some difficulty. And he's saying, well, first off, uh, respect the people who are, are leading you. And there is like a, uh, a serious problem in our, our world today, especially in our, our culture today with a uh, lack of respect for those who have authority. Um, I mean, one of the places you'll see it most readily would be with our public school system. Uh, the way that teachers are discounted and disrespected is just unbelievable. Uh, or you can look at the way that our uh, emergency response people, our police, the way that they are treated by the general public. Um, you could look at the way that people who organize events or anything like that uh, over and over again, it is just unreal the way that those people are treated. And Paul's saying, if you want to have joy, then could you please cooperate? Could you please work with them instead of against them, right? So sound advice. Y'all are like, I don't know about that. All right. So we move on. Um, and we get to the part, uh, he says, be patient with everyone, uh, make, make sure no one repays a wrong with a wrong, but always pursue the good for each other and everyone else. That would be worth your time alone. Uh, make the good good for each other and, and everyone else. Pursue good for each other and everyone else. And then we get to the scripture that I want to spend some time with today, which is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in every situation, because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in every situation, because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And there's uh, a few things I want to mention about that verse that's why it's so important. Uh, one reason it's important is because this has been called uh, the Christi Christian standing orders. Like these are continual commands in our lives to rejoice always to pray continually and to give thanks uh, that that is what we are called to do if you've ever been wondering what is it I'm supposed to do with the, as a Christian you've always can turn to that and say I'm supposed to rejoice I'm supposed to pray I'm supposed to give thanks those are things that I'm never going to be relieved of that duty until Christ returns right so those, that's one thing. The other thing I would point out is John Wesley calls this uh, a good image of Christian perfection. Uh, that if you think about what would a good Christian look like, what would be a, a Christian who is living the life that they're called to live, it would be somebody who is rejoicing, who prays, and who gives thanks. They have a grateful heart, a thankful heart, uh, even in difficult circumstances. So those are two really good reasons. And then the first, the last one is, it's just a fantastic one for you to memorize and to know. The first part of it is rejoice always, rejoice always. And there's two parts to rejoice, remembering and rehearsing. And when it talks about Christian rejoicing and rejoicing always, it's about remembering and rehearsing. Now when it comes to remembering, uh, this may not be the best example, but this is the one I came up with this week. And that is that uh, many years ago now, my beloved New Orleans Saints won the Super Bowl. Right? It's, it's been a while. And uh, 
And yet, I still remember when they finally won after decades of being a fan where they would show up to games wearing bags over their head. Finally, Drew Breezes came in and helped them win. And I still remember the week after that, I watched all the highlights I could find of the game. I read articles about the game. And uh, I mean, for like months, I was still like, they won. They finally, finally won. And uh, you may have something like that in your life, something you look back on and you go, that was a really good day. That was a really good moment. Maybe it was the day that you got married or when you had kids or when the kid graduated and moved out or <laughs> you didn't have to pay for their bills or, or whatever the case might be. Or maybe it was the day that your husband shared a feeling, right? I love that joke. Uh, that, uh, that, you know, you look back on it and you go, I want to I savor that. I want to enjoy that. You know, maybe you build a statue in your living room to that day, you know, uh, that you, you find ways to remember that. And, and Paul is, is saying that when it comes to being somebody who rejoices, uh, that that's a piece of it. Remembering what Christ has done for us and celebrating that and remembering that is an essential part of, of holding on to that, even in difficult moments. The great news, the powerful news of what God has done for us out of God's great love for us. Second part of rejoicing is rehearsing. And uh, maybe you were in a school play, or maybe you've given a speech, or maybe you had to explain to your wife why you made a certain purchase. You had to pause and talk through it carefully and say, this is what I'm going to say, this is how I'm going to explain it, or this is how I'm going to persuade them, or this is how I'm going to be when I get on stage and I have to share this with the people in front of me. And so part of rejoicing is rehearsing. And when you were in school, you had your line, you know, unless you were the tree, right? You had your line that you, you would rehearse, and um, as a Christian people, we have our lines, and of course, that's our, our scripture, right? And um, God invites us to read them and memorize them and, and savor them. And when you think about how do you cultivate joy in your life, one of the things I'd recommend is memorizing scripture and, and reciting them and having them close to your heart and close to your lips so that in those moments where the time comes or the circumstances change, you're prepared, you know. So uh, some of the ones that I can think of when it comes to, you know, why we would want to rehearse and why we want to do, like, you know, there's so many good scriptures. Hebrews, God will never leave or forsake us. Uh, the book of Romans, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Um, if God is for us, who can be against us? He will surely comfort us in our, his, our affliction. He who began a good work in us will surely bring it to completion. Our names are written in the, in the book of heaven. Um, I mean, all these wonderful verses that are in there. You know? And time and time again, if you'll take the time to read them and memorize them and recite them, uh, it'll make a huge difference. Now, Maybe you're thinking to yourself, that seems a little awkward. I don't want to sit at home and do that on my own. Well, good news. We have Sunday school classes and Bible studies, and y'all can rehearse your lines together and work through those scriptures and develop that within your life. Fantastic way for you to do that. And what a great thing it is. I mean, when you get into a bad situation or a hard time, and there's scripture that you can bring forth and remember and rehearse, and that it makes such a difference in terms of being able to rejoice always. So, just think for a quick moment, you know, what, what scriptures are your go-to scriptures? God is love. What, what, what are the ones that have always been meaningful to you? And, th and just know that there's, there's even more that you can find in the Bible that can bring you the same kind of joy. So rejoice always. Remember what God has done. Rehearse what God has promised. And uh, the second part is pray continually. Now, I mean, on a very simple idea, it would look like you're just supposed to lock yourself into your prayer closet and stay there, right? 
but uh, even Paul went out and did a lot of things, and uh, it's not the situation that we're called to either, that we would continually be locked up in our prayer closet or praying somewhere alone, uh, but rather it's more about knowing that we depend upon God in each and every moment of our lives, and that we need to continue to have a conversation with God and talk with God. And praying continually, two pieces of that are that we should have scheduled prayer and spontaneous prayer. Scheduled prayer, spontaneous prayer. Scheduled prayer, for me, is early in the morning. Um, I find that if I don't do the important things in the morning, they just don't happen. I mean, my day gets away from me. There's all kinds of things that I have to do, responsibilities for, that I have to take care of. And so for me, it's, it's to get up early in the morning and spend time with God, get my phone out, pull up the scripture, do my devotional, read the, uh, what I need to, and to spend time with God on a scheduled basis. And it makes such a huge difference to get before God, let God share God's love with me, and to have time that I can be with God. It makes such a huge difference to have a scheduled time with God. And I would encourage you, uh, to have that as well. If you don't, that would be something that would greatly improve your walk with God and your, t your relationship with God and help you in ways you can only imagine. And God likes to uh, hear from us, you know. Um, I don't know how it is for you, but there's times where I'll get wrapped up in uh, my work or get busy with something and um, my phone will go off. And, you know, nine times out of ten, it's somebody telling me about my car warranty. That's, <laughs> those are about, those are a bulk of my calls. And then um, there's times where I'll look down at the phone, and um, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, there's times where I look at the phone and I go, I really don't have time to talk with them, right? None of y'all. These are other people, right? <laughs> and... Uh, but, you know, if, if my wife's name show up on my phone, I'm going to grab it and, and talk, right? Why? I'm smart. And secondly, <laughs> because what she has to tell me is, is very important. I'm married to her. I love her dearly. And so each and every time that she calls, I'm going to answer it. Even in the times where I might be a little upset or mad, right? We're going we're gonna to talk. And the same thing holds true with our relationship with God. If we're followers of Christ, if we're walking with him, God wants to hear from us. God listens to us. God cares. And so when Paul says pray continually, he's saying have your scheduled time, have your spontaneous times, be aware of what God might be trying to, to bring into your life through the work of the Holy Spirit in those times. And um, I don't know. I don't know what it is you, you pray about. Um, I think it's always good for us to continue to talk with God about whatever's going on in our life, whether it's something that's in the immediate or something we've been praying for for years, uh, to continue to pray about that. Uh, and then finally, he says, give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now, he doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances, does he? No, he doesn't. He doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances. Paul's not mean. He's not saying give God thanks for the hard things that are happening in your life. He's not saying give God thanks for the tax audit. He's not saying give God thanks for your time you wasted at the DMV. He's not, he's not saying that. He's saying give thanks in all circumstances. You know, that's, that's the point that he's trying to bring home to us today. He's saying, give thanks in, in all those circumstances because God is with us. God has done a great thing for us in Jesus Christ. John Piper said, God is always doing around 10,000 things in our life and in our world, and you and I only tend to notice about one or two of them. Right? God is always about doing great things that we have. And give thanks in all circumstances. Um, for uh, a number of years, I worked with another pastor, and um, for a, a while, one of the things I noticed was that he was always 
um, getting gifts from people. Like, uh, for whatever reason, people just love to bring the guy gifts. And I, I kind of looked at my own life, and I was like, why don't I ever get any of that? Um, <laughs> and uh, and I, I, so I began to take notes. I was like, what does he do differently, right? And whenever anybody would bring him anything, whether it was a donut or something, you know, important to him, he would always, like, pause and give them a great deal of thanks for whatever they had done. And um, this is the same kind of thing that we see Paul pointing out. He's saying, if whatever it is that you're given, wh- whatever it is, another day, another breath, another moment, another opportunity to, to live, he's saying, give, give thanks for that, rejoice in that, and you'll have even more in abundance, right? Uh, when we have children, we, we want them to give thanks for gifts that they are given, tell the people they're thankful because we're trying to cultivate within them a, a grateful heart a heart that gives thanks to God. And what do you have to be thankful for today? What do you need to give God thanks for today? So that key verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. And Paul finishes out in a way that I want to share with you today. He says, um, verse 19, Don't suppress the spirit. Don't brush off spirit-inspired messages. But examine everything carefully and hang on to what is good. Avoid every kind of evil. Now may the God of peace himself cause you to be completely dedicated to him. And may your spirit, soul, and body be kept intact and blameless at our Lord Jesus Christ's coming. The one who is calling you and faithful is faithful and will do this. So Paul has told them to rejoice, to pray continually, and to give thanks. And then he finishes out and he says, and, and here's how. And when I look at the passage, what I see Paul saying is, stay committed to Jesus. Or make a commitment to Jesus. You know, that is what has been keeping him joyful while he's in prison. And that is what kept that community in Thessaloniki joyful in even the worst of circumstances. And it holds true for you and I. That complete devotion, that complete commitment to Christ and to following him is what can help us be joyful in all circumstances. We run into all kinds of sorrows and troubles. Uh, We become sad. We become depressed when half of our devotion is in Jesus and the other half is in our bank account. Uh, We become fretful and worried when part of our faith is in Jesus and the other part is in our government, right? And, And what is Paul saying? He's saying, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind, all that you are, make a dedication to who Christ is and live him, live for him. That is his calling that he's placing upon your life and mine. Have you made that full commitment? Have you given your whole heart over to Christ? Have you made that decision? Are you a member of the church? Have you been baptized? Have you found a community of people to support you as you follow in Christ so that you can rehearse those lines of faith together and rejoice in what God is doing in the world? Have you made a commitment to Christ so that his spirit cleanses you and makes you holy and blameless? so that you are prepared for the day when he returns. Have you made that kind of commitment? Oh, what a joy it is to make that decision, to no longer be half-hearted and lukewarm or kind of halfway on one side and then the other as well. That making that full commitment and that choice and that decision to say, I want to follow Jesus no matter what the circumstances are or what happens in my life, I will follow him. The rest of the world can make its own choices. I am making a choice for Jesus. Have you made that decision today? If you have not, then you should today. It would be a fantastic day for you to do that, to make that commitment. 80% of the people in our community, in Beaumont alone, do not go to church, do not follow Jesus. You could be somebody who lives a different life, a life that follows Christ. 
a life that is like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. You could become salt and light in this community. You could be part of the kingdom of God. That is what the choice is before you. Make that decision today and rejoice always. Pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, if we were honest, we would, we would certainly recognize that we are not joyful, or we don't pray enough, and we certainly are not grateful for what we have been given. So we pray that your grace, your mercy, and your love would comfort our hearts in this moment work at the hardness within us, the stubbornness, the disobedience, the anger, the disappointment. May your grace just wash over us this day. You have invited us into an amazing life. You have called us out from this world, and yet we continue to fight you, fight you for things we really don't believe in, for things that we really don't want, and yet we still seem to be holding on so tightly to whatever it is. So Lord, it, it takes more than our own efforts or our own willpower. It, it requires you this day to so come and be the great and the mighty and the awesome God that you are. Move within our presence this day and in our hearts and in our world. And help us, Lord, to make a commitment that you, you alone, are worthy of our praise. You alone are worthy of the life and the time that we have in this world. That you alone are the author of our salvation and the perfecter of our faith. Lord, we pray that in the days and the weeks to come, you would help us to rejoice more, to pray more, and to be grateful for all that you have done in our lives so that we can be a shining example to this world and that the world might know who Christ is through our lives and through our church. All this we pray and ask in Jesus' most blessed name. Amen.